completely obvious question about music theatre and, and early composition training, I think. Is that right in Melbourne Uni? Or in yeah, and no, I never kind of studied composition, so I studied classical singing, uh-huh, which I was right. pretty bad at. <laughs> <laughs> and then WAPO Music Theatre, yeah, uh, and on to your cabaret work, and then Shane Warne, obviously. And then the journey from that to writing a play for the Melbourne Theatre Company, like, what was that like? It was pretty weird, because I... Um, uh, the for a start, I, I, I'd sort of been thinking about writing a play, and I think the motivations of writing a play were probably quite superficial. They were like, you know, can I do it? You know, yeah. can, is it, it's going to be a big challenge. Can I take away songs? Which, interestingly, like with with the cabaret when I first started doing cabaret like with Angry Eddie, the one that you directed, it was almost all songs. I think with very little tiny amount of text, yeah. text between it. And as the shows went on, you know, that started to even out more. Um, and I got more confident writing text for myself, which kind of was m- mostly stand-up, I guess. And then um, <clears throat> writing Shame on the Musical, I kind of had this idea that I would um, collaborate with a book writer. But every time I tried to collaborate with someone, they never wrote anything. <laughs> like they would, you know, we would have really good meetings, and, yeah. you know, we'd drink lots of wine and we'd talk about ideas, and it was really great. But then at the point at which you want to something to work with and bounce off. It just it kind of never eventuated. I, was, I don't know whether that's just the circumstances of the people that I was sort of talking to. Well, the, the amount of wine consumed at the meeting. Yeah, yeah, too much, <laughs> too much wine. But, um, you know, I, I when I first started writing songs, one of the big challenges was that I had no um, right, no permission. I didn't hadn't studied it. I didn't get that piece of paper that, yes, you know, you are a writer of songs now, so you can just chill out about that. Um, it was just by doing it enough and having it work enough in front of an audience that I eventually just got over it and went, okay, you, you're a songwriter now. So that's because you're doing it and you're, you know, you're touring shows and people are kind of paying to see them. So that's it. You're a songwriter and you just get used to that. And then, um, exact same challenge with writing script. Like I don't have, any, I didn't study playwriting. I don't know any of that stuff. And, um, so there was, kind of a paranoia about that but I realised that when I was writing Shame on the Musical I really knew what I, what I wanted to say and then I should probably just write the book myself but I had very little confidence in it and when I did it um, the first time around with Neil Armfield you know he had just come off the back of doing Keating which is all, all songs just song, song, songs. there's actually no spoken dialogue in it and he was really anti kind of book scene. So he would just, wherever he could, he'd be like, just cut, cut, cut. And because I was sort of not very confident, I was like, okay, and it's Neil Armfield. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I was always disappointed that I, that that happened, but it was just the state of where I was at, confidence wise with writing. And, um, when it came around again this time and, and Simon Filtz was directing, I was like, well, I'm just going to write book scenes and, and that's what's going to happen. And that was fine. Um, and writing the play was like, well, can I take away these islands, which they are in cabaret and music theatre, you know, you know, you're kind of flailing about in the oceans of dialogue and then you land on a song and a song has a beginning, a middle and an end in it and it solves a dramatic problem and you know, I swear I feel really at home, I feel like, okay, I'm on, I'm on solid ground here. What if I took away those islands and it was just massive, expansive ocean, would I be able to navigate it, you know? And I realised it's actually kind of similar to songwriting in a way. It's very difficult, and I don't think I um, solved absolutely every problem, but um, uh, th- there was this sense that you can have little dialogue arias. Like it's very much you know, there's recitative moments, and then there's moments which were, were really like songs, and especially because of the style of the beast. It was I never wanted it to be naturalistic. I always wanted it to be sort of heightened, and this world of values where um, you know, you've got these middle class couples. The things that matter to them aren't really that important. They've got the they've got the hierarchy of importance completely wrong. So, mm. 
you know, they wouldn't, they're not so worried about the heinous things they've done in their you know, cheating or stealing or killing or whatever. They're, but not knowing, not knowing what wine to choose for a dinner party is a lot more terrifying. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so to be able to create that world, you know, you needed to have these breakout moments. And so, and they really did play like, like little songs, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, as a result of that, they were the most difficult things in the rehearsal room because actors tend to start at naturalism and then, you know, you kind of crank the handle until they, they get up. But when you're first doing things fairly naturalistic and you come to this very strange moment, which is impossible to play naturalistically, it exists like a, a brick wall in the middle of the road. And the first instinct an actor has is let's smash this wall down it's not it's not working yeah where i was like why don't we just raise the the road you know Mm, 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 mm. raise the temperature so that when we get to this thing we just sail over it it all fits within that one mode but you do have to go through a process to get to that Mm. so yeah it was tricky and and brett she was um just starting he hadn't quite started he was still doing melbourne festival he sort of had this juggling of two things going on and he called me in for a meeting, he wanted to see if I had an idea for a musical, and I and I, I didn't. Well, I did, but I was sort of, which is it's all died now. But I was talking to someone else about it, and um, I said, "Oh, I've got this idea for a play, though. You know, based on a real life thing that happened when I was living in the Yarra Valley in Hillsville. We kind of fell in with all these this kind of um, foodie wine." industry people and had this dinner where a couple literally bought a calf, had it slaughtered and everyone chose, went to the butchering, chose the cut and, um, and then, you know, provided a, a course for this multi-course degustation meal based on the, the bit of the animal they'd taken away, a celebration of nose to tail eating. Um, but the butcher, the mobile butcher, you know, his little kind of refrigerated van had the carcass in the back of the van and a knife stuck on the side and he's getting ready. And the, and the thing was on uneven ground. It shifted and he fell onto his knife and cut oh. his hand open and had to be rushed to Ringwood Hospital. <laughs> and he got stitched up and vanished up. And he came back, you know, gloved up and did three hours of butchering with this oh, crazy... Which you were at. Yeah. And all the kids were at and it was like there was, you know... Um, Mobile coffee machine and <laughs> barbecued uh, bacon and eggs. Was there soy milk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like uh, it was it was pretty pimped out. And um, <laughs> Juji country, you know, Juji yeah. country. Yeah. And um, and so you know, at the dinner party, we laughed like, oh, what would happen if you know we had to do the butchering ourselves? And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if you rewound another step and they had to do the slaughtering themselves? How would people cope? And that's, I just basically pitched that idea to um, Brett and I'd written a little bit I'd written maybe and I had a couple of scenes in mind and um, he loved the idea and like it's a 15 minute meeting and he was like yeah yeah you know Brett Shea is very enthusiastic he's like oh, oh yeah yep, yep that sounds really good yep we'll do it I was like really okay and that was it so I just started writing and workshopping and went through a few workshops and um, and yeah, and then it was kind of green lit, and, and it happened in that zeitgeist slot, which was which was terrific. After the fact, everyone's like, "Oh, isn't that isn't that great?" You know, we always knew it would work, but you know, the, there was a lot of meetings. <laughs> you know, because a lot of serious faces. Yeah, a lot of me. serious faces, and meaning like, "Can you say this?" Like the the cast weren't comfortable saying a lot of stuff in the play. Mm. Um, the company were terrified because they just could. We, uh, I was adamant, which is, you know, which is, doesn't mean anything, but I, I was really adamant that we get to um, previews and try yeah. this stuff in front of an audience because comedy lives or dies in front of an audience. And I just, you know, we were second guessing ourselves. The comedy had run out in about week three and everyone exactly. just thought this. And with a black comedy, when you don't, when you're not sure it's funny anymore, it's basically just two hours on stage of just saying fucking atrocious things. Mm. And um, all the actors felt very exposed by that. The company felt really exposed. They didn't want to use... The only place they had, like, solid houses were in previews. Mm. And they didn't want to squander the ability to have word of mouth spread from Mm. this kind of core preview audience, which is all their kind of group bookers and everything. Mm. and spoil word of mouth for the rest of the season by having shows that weren't, you know, ready. So they kind of didn't want to leave a lot of those comedic decisions about what stayed and whether things were too dark to the previews. They wanted to make those, those calls in the rehearsal room. And um, 
And so, you know, I had some really great conversations with Brett Sheehy about it, and he was amazing. Like, I just said... I kind of had to say, look, I understand all of the the financial terror involved in this, but the only reason that I am doing this play or that I even got to have a meeting with you is because I've sort of trusted my comedic and satirical yeah. instincts. It's what you're known for. Yeah, and, now, and, and I think that if you take the claws out of this piece, it's going to be way worse for us um, than if we really go for it. Like, if we go for it and, and it has something to say and it does you know, kind of make people uncomfortable, it's going to be way better than if we round off and smooth all the edges for people. They'll feel jibbed by that. They, you know, we need to go, we need to go hard. It did, it did strike that chord that you were, that you kind of said you were after though. You know, it was kind of, it was very, it was very black mm. and it was very funny. Yeah, which know? is good. Lucky it was funny. That was the thing that because the cast were like, I don't get why some moments are funny like I don't understand and I was like well no, maybe they're not but let's let's try yeah and did you in, in the rehearsal room uh, as the play was uh, uh, being rehearsed I, I gather you did a lot of rewriting on the hop yeah heaps and is that was that kind of something that you were watching the work on the floor going I think I'd like to adjust that or was it something that you that you were kind of getting I, I can't make this work please sort it out for me or was it combination of the two or well it was it was a lot of stuff on the on the hop like heaps of stuff that I was rewriting all the time um, and you know I think that the actors and the, and the director Ian Sinclair did a great job probably would have liked me to have just left them to it but I, re- I refused to do that and, I, <laughs> and I, there was one I thought okay I'm, I'm this is not going to be one of those shows where me and the actors and the director are going to be hanging out in the spa mm-hmm having champagne and being best mates. This is, this is about the, the quality of the idea and what it is I want to say and i just got to not worry about that. 